All right. So yesterday uh, um, we got to uh, we got to Perik Zion Pusik Yud Zion, which is uh, on page uh, page uh, uh, three twenty six. Now uh, yeah, we were speaking yesterday about about Hakar Satov about the concept of uh, of appreciation, uh, which is uh, you know we had mentioned that being a fundamental. And one of the things I forgot to mention to you yesterday, uh, um, a guy told me, a guy, a guy who became a Baal Shiva, so he was at the University of Michigan. And uh, Michigan or Michigan State? Magic played at State. Uh, Michigan was the Fab Four. So he was, uh, he was hitchhiking in Michigan, and a car stops him. And there are two black guys driving in the, in, in the car. So he's hitchhiking with a backpacker. You know, guy's twenty years old. So he was hitchhiking. He was hitchhiking in Michigan, and uh, and uh, he gets in his car. These two black guys are driving, and he starts striking up a conversation with them, and they're not really responding to him. They're barely talking to each other. And he's driving along, and all of a sudden they 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 get on an off ramp, and as they turn onto the off ramp, a state trooper cuts them off in front, and another state trooper cuts them off in, in back. The drawn shotguns get out of the car and put your hands up on the car. So these two guys get out of the car, and it turned out that they were escaped convicts from Jackson State Penitentiary. They'd just stolen the car, and they gave him a ride. Now, a chesed committee, they weren't. Right? So who, know, who, knows, who knows where they were taking him and what they were going to do with him? You know, with him. These are not guys that just escaped convicts. So uh, he told me that he got out of the car. The cops are standing there drawing shotguns. And so these two guys put their hands on the car. He says he came walking towards the cops. He said, listen, I'm not with them. Get your hands up on it. <laughs> you know, they said, okay, 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 don't shoot. You know, so they, you know, eventually he, he talked his way. You know, he let them know that he wasn't, he wasn't with it. But uh, so, so uh, you know, there's, a, there's an important lesson that, that part of, you know, we spoke about yesterday about appreciation. And the idea behind honoring parents, the Gemara says, part of the idea behind honoring parents is that you have to show appreciation to your parents, whatever they've done for you. We all have a whole list. Of, of complaints and gripes against our parents, right? My, sure, my kids have a list against me. They won't let me see it, but I'm sure they've got a list, and so we got a list. Everybody, my parents didn't do this, they gave me too much of this, not enough of this, why were they this? We got all these good, bottom line is they give, parents give children life. So you have a debt of gratitude towards your parents. The Gemara says that the debt of gratitude you pay towards your parents is also, besides the basic debt you owe them, there's also the idea that it should instill in us a debt of gratitude to God to realize what God has given us. And because God is intangible, so it's sometimes hard for us to hard for us to, to, to internalize it. But if you're already thanking your parents and you have all the laws of honoring parents which instill in us gratitude, so then the next logical step is, well, God, if my parents gave me life, so then God himself gave me life. And therefore, I should have a debt of gratitude to God. Now, part of that debt of gratitude is Obvious, the obvious things that we do have, you know, if you're healthy. So people say, well, why shouldn't I, you know, why should I be happy? Why should I thank God that I'm healthy? Well, just go take a, take a walk through the oncology ward of any hospital, and you'll probably be uh, filled with gratitude towards God. Go take a walk through any, any uh, 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 internal medicine ward in the hospital, and you'll be filled with gratitude towards God. We make a bracha when we come out of the bathroom and relieve ourselves successfully. There's a bracha asher yatzar that we make, that our body, which essentially runs miraculously, and we think, well, you know, but that's how God created me, yeah. But what about on the days when you're not regular, right? What about days when you're not regular in either direction, right? And you're thinking to yourself, is this ever going to change, right? And then one day it does change, you go, oh, I share you, sorry, that's all. right? That's the brother, we're supposed, so we're supposed to have that debt of gratitude all the time. But there are times in life we don't even know what we should have gratitude for. There's some things we've done which are so dumb I don't know if some of you have been in Israel. You ever run in front of a bus? The bus is at the stop, and you come running across the street and around the bus to get on. You ever done that? You know, you're you're running. You, you never did that. Okay, you will. If you're in Israel, if you're in Israel, you know, you, you will. You're you're across the street. The bus is at the stop, and you want to catch the bus. So what do you do? You run around the front of the bus because that's shorter than running around the back of the bus. You run around the front of the bus to get on the door. Right now, bus drivers in Israel have been known to pull out at about 60 miles an hour without looking while while yelling at a customer who's in the door. Right, and they don't see you. So you don't even know how many times God has saved you from doing foolish things. You know how many times God has God has taken. I had a guy here once who told me that he and his friends were on the way somewhere to do some cliff jumping. On the way to the cliff jumping, their car overturned. They were in an accident. They never made it to the site to do the cliff jumping. 
and they walked away from the accident. And you don't know what the, you know what did God do you when he when he saved you from getting the cliff jump. Cliff jumping is not checkers. You know you know I don't know exactly how it works. I've never done cliff jumping myself. Back in the days when I was a helicopter re rescue squad, you know, so we had some some dangerous brushes, but we never did any. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm afraid of heights. The uh, so, so the the uh, I always I always tell my wife, you know, I should if I you know I should have become an helicopter rescue guy. Those guys are always you know on the ladders, the hanging down over the ravine, over the abyss. There's always some guy on a cliff. Okay, buddy, we're taking you home. <laughs> yeah, we're here to tell you it's going to be okay, buddy. My wife says, are you chicken? You never. I wouldn't even go up in the helicopter to begin with. <laughs> go down on a ladder. So 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 we don't even know how many times God has saved. Us. That's the idea there for us at home. There are, other, there are times we know what God's given us. You have a parnasa. You have, got, you have, you have material means to, to exist. You have to thank God for that. you got a lot of people who don't. You have health. A lot of people don't. You have a family. A lot of people don't. And so on and so forth. Therefore, a person has to know. That's, the, that's what we're learning from Bakar Satov. Okay. Now, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, take a look in a uh, uh, Pasuk um, Chaf Gimel. Um, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, um, well, it actually begins a little before that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I skipped. I skipped ahead. Um, it's on uh, back on three twenty six, pasuk fifteen. Just to show you, just to show you what uh, uh, you know what's contained in within the lines of the Torah. Paro was trying to promote himself as a deity. Have you ever heard that idea that Paro tried to show that he was a deity, mm -hmm. and for that reason? He didn't relieve himself. Every 24 hours, he would go out early in the morning when it was still still dark out, and he would go to the Nile, and he would relieve himself. No one ever saw him relieve himself besides that. Okay? Now, they're two very deep. The very the basic idea is that Paro wants to show that, you know, I don't have normal human needs like other human beings, which, you know, shows you also how much a person is willing to do for honor. You know, I'm willing to put myself in that kind of discomfort for the sake of honor, to be a god, you know, 24 hours, I mean, that's, that's a long time. And then he would sneak out in the morning, and he would go and relieve himself in the Nile. Okay, now look what the Torah says over here. When God says to Moshe Rabbeinu the first time to approach Paro, let him know that the first plague is coming. On 326, it's two lines from the top. Vayomer Hashem al Moshe, God says to Moshe, Kaved leif Paro. Paro's heart has gotten hard. And the word kaved in modern Hebrew, do you know what that means? There's a type of food that, that some people eat, called liver. Liver in modern Hebrew is called kaved. I don't know if you are liver eaters or not. Some like chopped liver, right? Probably, I imagine you do if you're Jewish. I personally do not. I am Jewish, but I don't like chopped liver. And uh, uh, but kaved is liver. Now the nature of liver is the more you cook it, the harder it gets. That's paro. Paro is called kaved. He's liver. The more he gets cooked, the more obstinate he gets. So that's the comparison to paro being called liver. He gets he gets cooked. He's getting cooked, and 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 the more he gets cooked, the uh, uh, the harder, the more obstinate he gets. He turns he turns stronger, which is true for many people. So he says, "Kaved liver." By the way, liver is the only food that uh, liver you cannot kasher. You're aware that when it comes to kasher, you know you salt meat in Judaism. You salt either the chicken or the meat. You salt it, leave the salt on for a certain amount of time, about a half hour, and the salt actually draws. Out the blood. I ever seen so? I don't know if you are you aware of that halacha that you salt meat. And so I remember as a little kid. I haven't seen it since then because now it's done in the factories where they shuck the animals. I remember as a little kid watching my mother salt salt the uh, chickens, and you put the salt. It's got to be a layer of salt that's not too thin and it's not too thick. It's got it's a certain type of size salt that can get to all the cracks but won't dissolve on contact. And when you watch it, it's pretty neat because you watch it. You leave it on there for about twenty minutes. After I turn the blood, the salt actually turns red. That's what's that? Koshering salt, yeah, they call it koshering salt. It's about, yeah, about that big, yeah, and it's called koshering salt. And, and, and you put that salt on the, on, on the meat, and it actually draws the salt itself, it actually turns red, then you wash it off. Any red residue after that that comes out is not halachically considered, it's halachically considered not blood. There will be sometimes a red residue that comes out, but again, what, what determines whether or not it's blood is what the halacha says is blood. So if you will find, sometimes you can have a meat, you can have meat, which is, uh, you know, or chicken, which does have a, a reddish residue to it, but since it's crossed that halachic line, so it's not considered it's not considered halachically blood. So you could even have uh, people will eat raw, they, uh, you know, something called steak tartare, which uh, which I have never uh, indulged in, but apparently I went, the, the description would. Oh, please don't do that! Don't say that. Now you really you've eaten steak tartare? Yeah. You tell, you put ten seconds on each side and then eat it. Isn't it raw? It's just raw. Just raw. You don't eat ten seconds. 
You add a raw egg to it. Yeah. The raw egg with raw meat, yeah. raw pepper, and a few other things. You grind it up. Yeah. Oh, you grind it up. You don't eat it. You don't. You, you grind it up. Yeah. Ground beef. Oh, okay. It's ground beef. Oh, I thought it was. I thought it was. You eat it. You eat it. Just you cut it like a steak. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. I used to. So that's a, the ten seconds. That's a Pittsburgh. That's what they call Pittsburgh. That's Pittsburgh. You put like ten seconds on each side. Oh, I, but then you grind it up. Oh, I didn't know you grind it up. Yeah, I used to do that when my mom would make hamburgers. I would nip at some of the ham, the raw hamburger meat. It was pretty good. You know, it was, it was ground up. You know, it's garlic you know, and stuff. I was a little kid. I didn't know there was steak there. I thought steak there was you'd eat the steak and you cut it with a knife. And you're essentially eating raw meat, which uh, we don't do from Chicago. You know, maybe in San Francisco, you know, Chicago, we don't do that sort that of thing. Is beef tartare. Beef tartare. Uh huh. Ground beef. Ground beef, you grind it up, okay. If you grind it up, I have a little more respect for you. Why? But the because I don't eat, we don't eat raw meat straight. Raw meat, Yeah, but it's different because you got stuff in there, is it? Yeah, if you if it's ground meat, it's got all sorts of bacteria and stuff in there. I mean, it's more likely to get in kind of the middle of it. Yeah. At least, at least the, on the outside, it's. I mean, I haven't done it since I'm a little kid, you know. I, 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 usually, I usually have it well done. <laughs> uh, but whatever it is, whatever it is, if you have the red residue, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not conserved blood halakhically because the salt's been on, but it has to be on for a certain, certain amount of time. You can't do that with liver. Liver, it can only be kashered by roasting because river is called in halakha, uh, 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 the liver is called full blood. The liver is, is the, it's, 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 it's called dam. It's, it's essentially blood. The only way to kosher liver is by roasting it out. You cannot salt liver. And that's why kosher liver has almost no nutrients in it because the nutrients are basically roasted out. So it may taste good for those who like liver, but it's got no, uh, no nutri- very little nutritional value. Typical Jewish food. It's got no, it's got no, nutri- just plenty of cholesterol, no nutritional value. You know, that's, that's, that, that's the, uh, that's the way to go. So paro is called kaved. Now look what God says to him. Yom Moshe kaved le paro. He refuses to send the people. Look what the Pesach 15, it's the third line from the top. Lechel paro baboka. Go to paro in the morning. He's heading out towards the water. Walk confidently towards him. On the edge of the yor. That means he hasn't, excuse me, paro hasn't made it into the water yet. Now just picture this. This is his first time in 24 hours. He's head out there. He's got a newspaper with him. And, and, you know, it's dark and nobody's around and he looks forward to this peaceful time in the, in the Nile every morning. And as he's walking out, it's the worst thing. Like, oh no. <laughs> and somebody comes walking. Hi, Paro, top of the morning. How are you doing? And he, nobody's supposed to do it. And Moshe Rabbeinu is walking confidently towards him, which looks like he got an inside tip that he's going to meet him here. Go walk confidently. You know, you're walking towards him. I know you're going to be here, which already blows his cover. And on top of this whole thing, Paro is bursting. He hasn't been in the water yet, and now Moshe Rabbeinu's got to tell him, oh, by the way, you're going to get some plagues here, <laughs> right? And, oh, okay, anything you say, boss, can I go, please? <laughs> right? And, that, that's a, it, and that's all part of the all part of the torture. Then you notice that after, on Pesach 23, after Moshe Rabbeinu, after the whole incident, Vayifen Paro, Paro goes, the word Vayifen doesn't just mean he turns and goes home. Vayifen is also the Hebrew word for relieving himself. That means this whole time, Paro has been Paro has been holding it in. So, 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 so there's no there's no uh, coincidence over here that he catches them at the water edge. Now, number two, what was Paro trying to do here at a much deeper level? What's Paro trying? To, what's what is that? okay? You want to show you're a deity. You don't relieve yourself. What is it really the idea here? The idea here is in the ancient world, you know, kings are very very powerful. It wasn't like a democratically elected president who takes orders from everybody around him, especially his wife. You talk about somebody who you talk about somebody who was the somebody who was who, who who dominated the country. If you violated his word, you get thrown into prison. You could be executed for dropping a fly in his for dropping a fly in his drink. What do you call it? A, a pebble in his in his in in his food. I mean, it was it was a real dictatorship. Paro wants to show people is when you eat, you take in, but then you somehow you pass it out. Paro wants to show people I take in. And it can't get out, which is symbolic of how I run my country. You're slaves in my country. I've taken you in, and you're not about to get out. I've taken you in, and you can't get out. There's no escaping Egypt. There's actually a medrash that says no slave ever escaped Egypt. The medrash says that at every gate of Egypt, they, had, they, they, they were sorcerers. We see magic. They throw down the staff and turn them into a snake. They were sorcerers. So... Every gate, the Medrash says, had a pair of animals by that gate, magical, 
magical animals. So you had one gate where you had a couple of dogs, you had a couple of elephants, a couple of lions, a couple of things. So any slave that escaped out through any gate, the animals would magically start making noise. So if it, the dogs started barking, you knew somebody, bro somebody broke through, was trying to escape through dog gate. So all the Egyptian cops would nail them over there. But if the elephant started elephanting, whatever it's called, they do, it, you know, whatever, whatever. What's it called? Is that what it's called? The official, the official word. So then they knew they were at elephant gate, and so on and so forth. So nobody could escape. That's what Paro was trying to show the people. He was trying to show you nobody, nobody could possibly escape here. Okay. Now, take a look at uh, Pusuk, um, Pusuk, uh 25. It's on page 328. Before we take a look at this. Take a look at, um, uh, turn back for a second to Parshas Lech Lecha, which is the book of Bereshis, Perek Tasov Pasuk Yud Dalid, 68, page 68. God says to Avram Avinu, it's on the uh, fourth line, look, count five lines in the top of page 68. Vayomer Lavram, God says to Avram, if you find it, please show the person next to you. Five lines from the top on page 68. Vayomer Lavram, God says to Avram, Yadoa Teida, I want you to know, your children are going to be gerim. They're going to be foreigners, strangers, in a land which is not theirs. They will enslave them and torture them. Arba Melshana, 400 years. Now look at the next passage carefully. I will also judge that nation. Okay, now everybody knows that God has two basic avenues of relating to us. There's what's called din, which is what? Din is strict justice, strict justice. And there's rachamim, which is what? Mercy. God can be in a din mode, so to speak, or he can be in a mercy mode, so to speak. Now, again, this also has to be emphasized over and over. It's not a description of the essence of God. God is consistent and unchanging. It's not that God is in a bad mood, so okay, din. God's in a good mood, so okay, now there's mercy. God doesn't change. God has got no human characteristics that we could describe or imagine. What it means is that the way God relates to us, we from a human perspective would call it din. We from a human perspective would call it rachamim. So if a person is going through a hard time, he would say that's midas adin. If a person has has gotten out of a hard time, he would say God has activated midas harachamim. But it doesn't mean that God is changing, just the way we relate to and we describe what has transpired between us and God. So God says to Avram Avinu, the Jewish people are going to be there 400 years, they're going to suffer 400 years, but then I'm going to judge that nation. That means they're going to be hit with midas adin. Now, you want to see something remarkable? Turn back to where we are on page 328. Okay. So the Pasuk on page 328, five lines from the top, the Pasuk says, Vayimole shivas yomim, seven days are completed, achare hakosa shemes or after God hit the Nile. The, 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 the standard opinion is each plague lasted for seven days. Okay, now gentlemen, I want you to make a calculation. How many plagues were there? Ten. How many days of plague? No. No, no, why not? The last one was only, the plague of the firstborn was only one, one day, one moment of, of the plague of the firstborn. So you have nine plagues, each one lasted seven days, which is how much? 63. And then you have the last plague, which is one day. So how many altogether? 64. Now, God said, I'm going to judge them. That means what Mida, what, what, how, what did he activate against them? Midas? Hadin, right? Strict judgment against the Jewish, against the, 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 the Egyptian people. Look at the word din. Dalit is how much in the gematria? Four. Yud is ten. How much are we up to? Fourteen. And the final nun is how much? Fifty. How much altogether? Sixty-four. That's the sixty-four days of the plague. Midas Hadin. Midas Hadin is the sixty-four days of the plague that the Jewish people, that, that, that the Egyptians get. Seven times nine is sixty-three. Those are the first nine plagues. And then the last one is the last one is only one day, so you got sixty-four days. That's the Midas Adin, which God promised Avram Avinu all the way back then. Now, there's a famous philosophical question here. I don't know if philosophical is the right word, but there's a famous uh, a, a question here, which is like this: God told Avram Avinu that the Egyptians are going to that, that, the, that the Jewish people are going to be enslaved by a foreign nation. He didn't say the Egyptians. He said they're going to be enslaved by a foreign nation. They're going to be tormented by them for four hundred years. So why is it that if the Egyptians did it, and really they're carrying out God's will, why should they be punished? Isn't that what God said is supposed to happen? 
So why should they be punished? Very good, very good, very good. In other words, nobody asked you to do it. And if you did it, nobody asked you to do it with such enthusiasm. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people got out after how many years? 210 years. Because the 400 years of suffering, because of the intensity, the intensity compressed it into 210 years. Because if I tell a person you have to go through 10 suffering points, let's say 10 suffering points, you got to hit on the finger with a hammer is 10 suffering points. And a guy hits him on the finger with a sledgehammer, so how much did he get? He just got a 20. Right? So because the Jewish people are supposed to suffer over a longer period of time, but there are two ways of accumulating 400 points. You could accumulate 400 points in length, or you could accumulate 400 points in intensity. So the, not only the Egyptians took it on themselves, not only they took it on themselves, but they took it on themselves and did it with enthusiasm. Had the Egyptians come along and said, we are torturing the Jewish people for the sake of serving God, to carry out God's will, it could be things would have been, things would have been seen differently. You still have to get permission to do it. Nobody asks you to do it. That's a mitzvah everybody wants to do. You know, if I say, you know, if I take one of my kids, you know, you deserve a potch. Then the sister comes over and gives her a potch. Right? Who made you the shliach over here? Who told you to be the one to carry it out? You know, I didn't tell you. I just said she deserves a potch. I didn't say you should potch her. I said she deserves one. I didn't say, yeah, you're doing me a favor and potch. All of a sudden, that mitzvah you do. When I ask you to do the dishes, that you don't do. But when she needs a potch, all of a sudden, there you are, Johnny on the spot. You know, Johnny, Johnny on the potch. You know, I didn't ask you to do it. So the Egyptians on one level are, you know, if they would have said, we're doing this, or the shame mitzvah is doing it, you know, to, for the sake of, could be things would have been different. But they didn't do that. They did it because they, for their own benefit. Nobody asked you to do it. This needed to be done. Nobody asked you to do it. Therefore, you deserve the punishment. And then the super intensity of it, is what causes the Egyptians to then, the Jewish people are released after 210 years because they managed to compress the intensity all into that short period of time. Yeah, go ahead. Is there an alternative explanation to that? To why, even though it's prophesied to be 400 years, that it ends up being 210 years? There is a, one of the explanations of the 400 years begins from the time that Isaac was born. The time that Isaac was born, and because when Isaac was born, that he goes out, Yitzhak, he goes and leaves the land, the land of Israel, he goes into, he is considered a, a foreigner. God says, I mean, your children, will be foreigners in a foreign land. And even though Yitzhak is in the land of Israel, the land of Israel didn't belong to him yet. The Jewish people hadn't entered in the time of Yeshua. So he's a foreigner in a foreign land just as we are today. He's a foreign, that is one of the calculations. The 400 years begins from the time Yitzhak is born. That's to cover the number 400. But if you want to see that 400 years of suffering, the 400 years, the other explanation is that the 400 years of suffering was compressed into 210 years. It, it, to me, sounds like a kind of like an explanation in hindsight, oh, how can we possibly explain this? And then we come up with, we just kind of create something. Because there's no like standardized unit of suffering, and then you receive, okay, here's one unit of suffering, and I'm going to give you 400, but I'm going to give you them to you in 210 years. Good. It sounds like somebody's just trying to like, in hindsight, make it make sense. I agree with you. I agree with you. It certainly sounds like that, other than the fact that since it's recorded in the Talmud, and the Talmud is based on the tradition that we have dating back to Sinai, so it wasn't made up. It certainly sounds like that. There are a lot of things in the Talmud that sound okay. like that. It sounds like somebody came up with an explanation. Well, that's interesting. The only problem so, is... So this, this particular part is also part of the oral tradition? Of course, of course. Oh, this is all part of... Everything I tell you is part of the oral tradition, and you're absolutely right. There are parts of the oral tradition that sound like, you know, well, you know, all right, that, that sounds... That's, that sounds interesting, except that we have a tradition on the oral, on, on the oral Torah, uh, Torah dating back to Sinai. That's the only fallback position we have. The fallback position we have is that we begin from a perspective that it is true because we have a tradition given to Sinai. Are there logical questions that we could ask? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, 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 in many areas of Judaism. Why should I pay $1,000 for my son's tefillin? You know, tefillin, $1,000? I mean, if I showed you how much, how much do you think tefillin costs? You know, 1000 bucks. With that, that's with all the extras, power straps, power brakes. You know, they, they, you know, you get a thought. You can pay five hundred dollars for something. You can pay fifteen hundred dollars, and then all all your thirteen year old son needs to do is leave it on a bus somewhere the day after his bar mitzvah. You know, <laughs> and, 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 did you put your name in the bag? I forgot to. You know, I told you, I was telling you for two months to put your name. You know, that's all. Does it make sense? It makes sense. You take an orange lemon and pay eighty bucks for it. Doesn't make any sense to me. If anybody says it makes sense, you know. See me afterwards. You know, I got I got to talk to you. Yeah, I got to take a lemon and, and 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 a spear, a lemon and a, <laughs> and, a, and a green spear off of the thing. And I got. I only have one way reason that I believe it is because the entire thing is true. I have enough proof that the entire thing is true that the things that I'm skeptical about 
are also, I start from a given, you know, if there's a shortcoming, a shortcoming, but your question is an excellent question. So a lot of things are with hindsight. Here, I'll give you another example. This is, this is a minor point. Uh, it says in the Nach that Shoal, Shoal was the first king of the Jewish people. You're aware of that. Okay. King Shoal, there's a posuk that says he was one year old when he took the reins. Now, I mean, Jewish kids are precocious, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. But one year old, you know, a one, one year old, what do you do? He's, he's with his bottle, you know, and he pulls out the mouth, says, let's attack the plishtim. Yeah, 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 you know, something about it, something about it ain't making, ain't making sense over here. He's what, and it says, Ben Shol, Ben Shona Shol Bemalcho is a pusik in the Nah. He's one year old when he, he's one year old. What does that mean? The answer is that without an oral Torah, none of the written Torah can be understood. There's got to be an oral Torah. Because if I say to you, well, there's a pusik that says, honor your parents. I do. I don't call them any names. <laughs> well, that's not enough. How do you know? How do you know it's not enough? You tell me you got to stand up for your Where'd you get that from? How do you know you got to stand up for your parents? Don't say that in the written Torah. Doesn't even say what tefillin are. It's called them totafos. The word tefillin doesn't apply anywhere in the, in the written Torah. You know, it doesn't say where to shecht an animal. It says you have to slaughter an animal. Yeah? Give me a bath, somebody. It doesn't, doesn't say anywhere about how to slaughter an animal. It doesn't say it. That's all oral tradition. It has to be. Without an oral tradition, there's nothing you do. To build a sukkah. Okay, I built a sukkah. You know how many details, halachic details there? I'm building a sukkah. You're absolutely right. None of these things, we wouldn't know anything without an oral Torah. That goes both for the halachic end of it, and it goes for the more, uh, let's call it the, uh, uh, the, the, the agadita end of it, the non-halachic parts of Torah, such as a story like this. There's no halacha that comes out of this. It's just... We have to have an oral tradition. So the Torah says that Shaul was one year old. That means he was as sinless. He was such a righteous tzaddik that he was as sinless as a one year old. Okay. And I'll tell you another thing, which is very important. I'm glad you brought this up, Mike. This is very, very important. There's an interesting medrash. The medrash says like this: A Roman noblewoman once confronted one of the sages from the Talmud, Rabbi Yossi ben Chalafta. She said to him, "You know, you got a story in your Bible." about 17-year-old Joseph, who went down to a den of iniquity called Egypt, and he remained pure. He remained virtuous. Come on. Come on. He's 17 years old. He's on a college campus. Worse, right? Maybe. And he's in, he's in Egypt. He's at the University of Arizona in summer. Right? He's being chased around left, right, and center. And you're telling me a 17-year-old in full red-blooded youth stayed virtuous? Come on, who are you trying to kid? Good question, isn't it? And the Torah says openly, Yosef the Tzaddik, he ran away from Mrs. Potiphar, and he stayed virtuous and all things. Come on, you want me to believe that? Honestly, I expect me to. You know what the answer was? The answer was the Torah itself. Pay attention carefully. He said to her, look, Ruvain says openly in the Torah that Ruvain was flawed. Ruvain sinned. Yehuda, it says openly in the Torah that Yehuda sinned. And these are people that are older than Yosef. They're with their father, under their father's supervision. And it says openly that they sin. So we don't whitewash things in the Torah. We don't whitewash. If Yosef would have sinned, we'd be the first one to say it. We don't hide anything. So if the Torah says he didn't, we don't have an agenda. That means he didn't. Because what they do, the Torah says openly that they do. I'll show you something even more remarkable. Pick any name of anybody you know in the Torah. Any name from any, anybody in the Torah. Pick a name, any name. First name comes to mind. Esther. Esther? And yeah, keep it in the written Torah for the time being. Uh, Jacob. Jacob. Jacob's criticized for marrying two sisters. Name another, another name. Binyamin is mentioned as one of the four people who never sinned. Good. <laughs> you, you nailed Binyamin. Good. He's one of the four people the Gwar says never sinned. Pick another name. Any name. <laughs> Moshe. Moshe, Moshe lives 969 years. He's the record holder. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is criticized for getting angry. Aaron is criticized for the golden calf. Miriam, Miriam is criticized for speaking Lashon Har about Moshe. Adam Harishon, Adam is criticized for, be, for sinning. Chava is criticized for getting him to sin. Uh, Noah is criticized for getting drunk. Avram Avinu is criticized for challenging God for not having faith. Yitzhak is criticized for drawing Ace of Nir. Yaakov is criticized for Tudah. Every name in the Torah, these are our national heroes. Every single name in Torah is, is, is criticized. So if we don't criticize, we're not whitewashing. And not only that, Yosef himself is criticized. 
Yosef is always criticized because he didn't respect his father properly, so he died before his brothers, the Gemara says. So if the Torah comes along and says, you know what, but this test he overcame. We're not trying to whitewash. As a kid, he's off on his own. We can't blame him if he fails the test. Not like Reuven, not like Reuven and Yehuda. And the Torah does. The Torah comes along and tells you a story he did. The proof is in the pudding. And if you study the Talmud, you'll find the same thing. Sometimes if you study the Talmud, you'll find that the Talmud comes up with an answer. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, that's a bit of a reach. A bit of a stretch, right? Except the Talmud itself will tell you that somebody's opinion is rejected because he's wrong. The Talmud itself will tell you that this thing that was transmitted was garbled. That cannot be an accurate transmission. So if the book itself tells you we're willing to admit a mistake, I once went to a doctor. I had some sort of bad infection. So I went to the doctor. The doctor didn't know what antibiotic to give me. He picked up the phone and he called a specialist. That's a doctor I would go back to. A doctor could admit he doesn't know. So when he tells me he does know, then he probably knows he has no pride. He has no problem. You understand, the doctor who knows everything, I just got a call last night, a guy, a friend of mine had meningitis, viral meningitis. He said the specialist in the hospital is a woman with an ego. She decided this is what he's got, and she wouldn't change her mind. It turned out she was wrong. She's lost all credibility. She's lost absolutely all credibility. She can't admit we're wrong. We admit we're wrong. We have no problem admitting we're wrong. And when you get married, you'll certainly see that you have no problem admitting you're wrong, because you'll be told you're wrong. Right? And you better admit you're wrong, otherwise you won't be married for long. So for, you know, so, so for a person, I've said to my wife, listen, I apologize for getting you to, for allowing you to get me upset. Yeah. What? what? <laughs> you got to say it fast and then out the door. But the, the, I, I, you know, we have no problem admitting we're wrong. Of course we're wrong. We're wrong to, in order to become right. Do you know, have you ever heard of WD-40? Do you know why it's called WD-40? You don't know. Okay, I'll tell you a perfectly useless piece of trivia. <laughs> because the WD-40 people tried 39 formulas before that, and it didn't work. It was only the 40th one that worked, so they called it WD-40. I forgot what the WD stands for. But the, 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 it was the, 40, the 40th formula that actually worked. So the total, we have no problem admitting that we're wrong. We have no problem. It doesn't make sense. So if we do come up with something, if we do come up with something, that means that we have an oral tradition on it. Okay, very important point. Okay, now take a look. Um, so that's why the Egyptians are punished. The Egyptians are punished because nobody asked you to do it. Okay, we talked about the frog already. Uh, turn to page Tes Zion. Perik Tes Pasuk Tes Zion. By the way, in Halacha, in Halacha, uh, uh, just say, with, with the intensity of the pain, how do you measure... And one of the one of the things one of the things that, that that people pay for they're different. If somebody harms somebody else, so one of the things that they have to pay for in the medical bills is pain. Pain. Guy hit somebody's finger with a hammer. Right? Now you owe him for the pain. How do you measure the pain? How do you measure how much pain it is? There are two opinions in the Gemara. There are two opinions in the Gemara. One opinion is, how much would you take to allow me to hit your finger with a hammer? I'll pay you ten bucks. Let me hit your finger with a hammer. <laughs> what would you say? No, thanks. 20. A hammer. A little swing. 150. Mm. 150, right on the knuckle. You didn't shake your head as fast as you did before. $10,000, Mike. What are my medical bills? I pay the medical bill. And $10,000? And $10,000. Oh, you get more if you say no. Yeah, that's true. Good point. I'm, I'm Jewish. You're going to hold out. out. <laughs> $50,000, final offer. Full medical bills. Full and, medical bills and fifty thousand right, dollars. Will you put my hand in a vice so I can't move it? So because I won't be able to retrieve Right. It. We'll do everything necessary to, to hit it with a hammer. Uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we accommodate you. We accommodate you in all ways, yeah, right? Yeah. Going to repair it. Yeah. Uh, everything. Everything that goes. I'll tell you what, Mike. Forget it. Let's not talk. A million dollars. There you go. <laughs> you know, vices, no nothing. You know, a million dollars. They talk a language, okay? So there's one opinion in the Gemara that the Bayesden, the court, makes an assessment. How much would your average person take to allow it to be done? The prevailing opinion is not how much would you take to, to allow it to be done, because that's too high. The prevailing opinion is how much would you pay for it not to be done? Because being Jewish, we'd always pay less. You know, listen, you want to do it to me, it's a million bucks. How much would you pay not to have it done? I'll give you 25. <laughs> I'll give you 25. You know, I'm not giving you a dime more. Here, take my hand. You know, you understand? So that's how we measure pain. So pain has a, an, an objective measurement, even in halacha. So when the Jewish people are, are, are in Egypt and they're locked up for what do you call it? So the intensity 
accumulates. And the intensity uh, equals the 210 years. All right, gentlemen, enjoy your vacation. Mm -hmm.